The question that, uh, or the title of today's sermon is this, what are you going to do with King Jesus? And um, <laughs> so if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 2. And uh, in uh, chapter 1, we uh, spent our time learning of Jesus' bloodline, right? The genealogy and how, how important that was, um, period. It was just important. It was important to the, the Jews uh, for them to recognize uh, who he was. Uh, and it was important in fulfilling the prophecies because we know that God does what he says he is going to do. And then in that process, we know that God will... All right? He will accomplish his purposes. We chanted that. We said that together last week. God will accomplish his purposes no matter what. No different today in today's message. Just understand that than all that we read and all the characters that we're going to be introduced to today is that God will accomplish his purposes uh, in this. And, um, and so this, uh, this Jesus was from the line of Abraham and the line of David, which, again, Matthew points out. That the genealogy not only fulfills prophecy, but it also proves that Jesus has the right genealogy to be the king. Amen. He's got a royal bloodline uh, from King David. And remember, uh, as we are reading Matthew, we're going to see that the Holy, Holy Spirit impressed upon him. So we have, guys, we have four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But each of them have a different emphasis. Each one of them is written from a different point of view for a specific purpose, all driven by the Holy Spirit. But guess what they all do? They all tell the same story. Amen. So, but Matthew, in Matthew's telling of the story, the Holy Spirit impressed upon him to write about how Jesus fulfills prophecy. He to write about like his sovereignty, his rightful place to be king of the Jews. And now in chapter 2, we have people who come and... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And they pay homage to Jesus as king. And we know them to be wise men. Now, I was asked a question the other day where some of us were sitting in here and visiting. And I was asked a question the other day. Why has it been so long since I had a visible illustration like a bear? on stage or a, or a dead raccoon or why am I not ripping my shirt off to reveal a Superman logo underneath my, my uh, shirt or uh, uh, I was uh, and then I was uh, reminded about the time that I preached in chains wearing a orange jumpsuit like a prisoner and so I figured it was time again today to do something like that so I dressed up as a wise man <laughs> oh, wise guy. I'll take it. I'll take it. A wise guy, not a wise man. I love you guys. Verse 1, chapter 2. Verse 1, chapter 2 of Matthew. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise man from the east came to Jerusalem. So here we have some characters that were introduced here. Um, now, I would have to tell you that there has been some time passed since the birth of Christ. So we had the birth of Christ and now some time has passed. It could have been up to two years have passed. And so now you have to go home and change all your nativities because the wise men were not at the manger. Okay? So... I'm, I'm joking. You don't have to change your nativity, okay? Just understand that, that some time has passed and Jesus could have been as old as two years old. And we're going we're gonna to learn about that as, as we move through. But, but that's the situation here. And so, uh, uh, so now we have these wise men who are coming. And uh, so we're, so, but the first character that's mentioned, um, it says, now after Jesus was born. So after, so Time had passed. So now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. And so now we have this character named Herod that you and I, we need to know a little bit about. Herod was also known as Herod the Great. Got any history uh, people in here? Did you learn that in school or learn that 
uh, when you're looking at the different time frames of, of empires and things like that. So Herod, Herod the Great, um, everybody say boo every time I say Herod. Herod. Oh, there you go. You're going to do that throughout the message, okay, so understand. Herod's not a good guy. Yeah, he's a bad guy. He was, uh, he was half Jewish and half uh, Idumean or Idumean, okay? Uh, that was just, uh, that was the name of the people. The Idumeans were, they were Edomites. And uh, Edomites, they, Edomites descended from Esau. So now we get a little better understanding of this guy's background and, and his lineage and who he is from. Right? We, we have Jesus who's from the line of Jacob. And now we have King Herod who is from the line of Esau. All right. Good job, guys. Good job. Herod <laughs> was known for his shrewd diplomacy and his public works program, which some remain until this day, including the Wailing Wall. He was uh, one responsible for building that. What we know is the waning, Wailing Wall at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But his household was a mess, as you can imagine. And uh, he had several wives and sons, some of whom he ordered to be killed. His wives and sons. He ordered them to be killed because of his fear that they were plotting against him. So kind of, can we kind of understand a little bit more about this character, Herod? Um, and this characteristic explains his response that we will get to in the next few verses. The next character that we have is we have the wise men. Now, somebody said, yay. <laughs> We're not going to do that, right? right? So we have the wise men from the east. And... Uh, they were known in other translations, they were really known as the Magi. The Magi. And unlike the famous song, We Three Kings, the Magi were not kings. So now we have to quit singing the song. No, we don't have to quit singing the song. You guys, man, come on. We don't have to quit singing the song, but just understand, they, they weren't really uh, kings. Uh, the, the, they were prominent priestly professionals. Did you get all that? Did you see all those P's? <laughs> they were. They were prominent priestly professionals who studied the stars and discerned the signs of the times. That's what, part of what they did. Th this was a hereditary priesthood. You know what I mean by that? Hereditary priesthood? Yeah. They were a lot like the Levites of Israel, but these were the Magi of Persia. All right, the Persian Empire. And so just like the Levites were born into their priestly duties, the Magi were born into their priestly duties. Okay, so this was a, a long-time family tradition to be a Magi. And they came from, again, they came from uh, Persia. And that, it was, uh, that was to the east of Jerusalem. So you have two kind of empires going on. You have the Roman Empire in the west. And you have the Persian, or what we're going to know, the Medes. Okay, that's another one. The Medes, they were in the east. So this, was, uh, this is what's going on. This is the dynamic that we, you and I are walking into when the Magi, the wise men, come to see Jesus. And so in the Magi were a tribe, from, again, from among the people called the Medes. And one of their jobs was this. And this is so cool. One of their jobs was to recognize and coronate kings. That's what they did. That's what they did in Persia. And that's what they came to do when they came to see Jesus, the Messiah. That was their job. And so, uh, in fact, uh, in my study and reading, you might, I know this is a lot of information. We're going to have this kind of day today, okay? It was going to be a lot of like this teaching stuff. But uh, so in my studies, it was, it was said that at this particular moment that Persia was without a, a leader. Their leader had like basically was unable to fulfill his duties as the leader. Okay. And so they needed a new leader. And so and the Magi also you have east versus west. And so some, some they were coming 
right? To maybe even say this could be our next leader that will lead us against taking over the world, taking over Rome. But they also definitely realized that this was a spiritual, godly, miraculous event as well. And that's what they were coming to see. Um, so that, this explains a lot as we see their activity when they come. So the Magi came to Jerusalem to the palace because that's where they, because they, they were in search of a king. And that's where they thought he would be. They thought he would be in the palace there in Jerusalem. But he ran in, they ran into uh, Herod. Amen. Boom. That's right. So verse 2, saying, they came to the palace and they came to, to him and they said, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So last week we had Matthew pointing out that Jesus had the lineage uh, to be king. And now you have the recognition that he is a king. The recognition, though, is coming from Gentiles, not Jews. A question usually arises here asking, where might have the Magi learned about the coming Messiah? Well, about 586 B.C., Israel was taken captive by the Babylonians. And while they were there, along with the Persians and the Medes, they told them about the king that was going to uh, be born. It is a thought even that they received information from a high-ranking Jew named Daniel. Named Daniel. You guys know who Daniel is, right? In Daniel chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, it says, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him, talking about Daniel, made him what? Chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. So now that we have Daniel, and he's in the Babylonians, along with the Persians and the Medes, and guess what, Daniel? He gets put in charge of the Magi. That's what takes place. And so that kind of gives us a little understanding of why, how did these guys even know what to look for and why? Well, they had learned from the Jewish people that they had conquered <laughs> and had overtaken. So here you have the non-Jewish world, the greatest officials of the, or or the Orient, the Magi, how important they were, the king makers of the world, and they see and recognize Jesus as king. But the Jews did not. John 1.11 speaks to that too in John's version of the Christmas story. His is very different from the others that we read, right? But in John 1.11 it says, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. They did not receive him. Another thing that we read in verse 2 was uh, the, the, the Magi, as they were talking to the king, they said, For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. His star. Well, as many, uh, as many of you know that in the Bible, stars represent angels. They represent angels. In fact, these sections of scripture that we're looking at today, the actual word that was translated to star was the word aster. Aster, which literally means a celestial being. That's what the word means, and it was translated to star when they translated uh, the scriptures. 
So from the evidence of what this star does, we have two possible explanations of what it could be. What could have led this group of magi to the King Jesus? It could be what is known as the Shekinah glory. Everybody heard of that before? The Shekinah glory of God? It could have been that, which uh, means the Shekinah glory means the dwelling of God. That's what that word means, the dwelling of God. And we saw this in the book of Exodus when God would lead the people by a, a cloud by day and then a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That was the Shekinah glory of God. All right, so this could be the star, could be a representation of the Shekinah glory of God, or this star was actually an angel that was only visible to the Magi and led them directly to the house where Jesus was. Because we know as we read that that's what the star did. It took them to the house where he was. Verse 3, you guys ready? Y'all into this? Good. Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So first of all, why was Herod, Herod troubled? Boo, yeah. Why was he troubled? Because this was a major event. And I, I know that traditionally we sing about and are told about three wise men, right? But that is only because there were three gifts. Right? There were, there were three gifts, but it doesn't translate to three wise men. We just like, you know how we are. We make things convenient, right? We make things convenient. We just shrunk it down. Yeah. They, they wouldn't fit in the t nativity, so we had to have three. <laughs> Excuse me. But there could have been as many as 12 wise men, all right? There could have been as many as 12. By the way, uh, any number that we throw out would only be a guess because the Bible doesn't say, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And because these were high-ranking officials of the Persian Empire, they would have been accompanied by troops, by the Persian army. And so when they rode into town, I mean, people noticed, right? These guys would have been dressed differently because they're from a different part of the world they would have come in with this caravan of people and not only that they went to the palace they showed up in downtown right where everybody was at and so there it was a big deal that these guys were coming and um and so when they rode into town people noticed and when they announced that they were coming to worship the king of the jews herod yeah he took this as a threat because right now, he's what? The king of the Jews. And we know how he feels about his throne. If he's willing to kill his own wives and children in order to protect his throne, we know what this man is capable of. And we know that this kind of threat would trouble him. If there weren't really a king out there, why would these men have traveled so far to come and pay homage to him? Herod, there you go, was already paranoid that there were those who were after his throne because that is the way he got there himself. It was by portraying and living and even killing to get there, lying to get there. His jealousy and his fear agitated him and he was such a ruthless leader that it caused the Jews to fear as well. And so it said all, and it disturbed all Jerusalem. Yeah, it caused them to, 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 to fear as well. If he got angry, he would do something fierce to the people that he ruled over. And we know that he does do that, true to his character. But before that, verse 4 happens. The king, he, he, he assembling, said verse 4, and assembling the chief priest and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So obviously, Herod, Herod yeah, he understood. He knew, he, he was ruler over the Jews too, so he probably had heard the story as well of the coming king. The Christ, as they called him, the Messiah. 
And so he called all the, the Jewish religious leaders to get the details of the birth of the king. And, um, and then this king was supposed to lead Israel to their freedom. And I'm sure that it was, it was frequently on the lips of the Jews under the Roman Empire. They couldn't wait, right? We even say that, right? We can't wait for Jesus to come back, right? And they were the same when it was like, we can't wait for the Messiah to come. They were anticipating his arrival. And this, this group of uh, chief priests and scribes, they consisted of um, the high priest. And so the high priest, these were the Levites. And from this group would be chosen one priest who would enter the Holy of Holies once a year on Yom Kippur. So we understand that. We go through that during Easter. We've told that um, story here. The Day of Atonement. And so uh, these were the head guys, and they ruled over the Sanhedrin, which Sanhedrin, the word Sanhedrin actually just means 70. So there were 70 uh, ruling elders along with them. Uh, and this would also consist of the temple police. And so when Herod... <laughs> When he gathered all these people, that's all who showed up, right? Is this a big deal? Yeah. It's a big deal. And, uh, and, and the scribes, again, were Jews from other tribes that were experts in the law. And they knew every little detail about the Old Testament. And we know that the Old Testament tells about the coming of Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself in John chapter 5, verses 39 through 40. Jesus says, you search the scripture because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus even says, hey, all that, it is about me. All of that stuff. And so the king had brought all these experts in because he's beginning his plot. He wants to know, where is this king? Where was he to be born? In verse 5 and 6, guess what? They tell him. They tell him, right? They didn't, they didn't, know, any, you know, they didn't know any better. They're like, he's in, he's in charge of us. And, and share, it's basically like sharing the gospel. So yeah, we're going to tell him of this. And they told him, verse 5, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And uh, that was written in Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. That's what Matthew was quoting there. It also could be uh, combined with 2 Samuel, chapter 5, verse 2. Uh, his wording there could include both of those things that he's quoting uh, there in this in this these two verses so Bethlehem is the city of David because that's where David was born and it was the city that was started by Salmon you guys remember Salmon from the genealogy of Jesus Salmon he was the husband of Rahab you guys know who Rahab is right yeah, so he was the, the husband of Rahab, and Salmon actually uh, started the city of Bethlehem. You guys remember that? When we went through the genealogy, we talked about that. In John chapter 7, um, verses 40 and 42, it says this, When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Because they thought Jesus was from Nazareth, from Galilee, right? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem? Like they knew. Like everybody knows that this was supposed to happen. The village where David was, Bethlehem. This was the city. Another interesting thing is what the name Bethlehem means. Bethlehem means house of bread. In John chapter 6, verses 32 and 35, 
Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You guys believe yet? Are you believers? Come on. Come on. So after Herod gathers this information, he meets with the wise man again, but this time it's a secret meeting. It's not this public affair, right? It's a secret meeting in verse 7 and 8. You can hold your booze. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. You guys know that Herod had no intention of going and worshiping Jesus, right? He was gathering information in order to protect his throne. He wanted to know what God's word said in order to willfully and sinfully go against the will of God. And I'm going to tell you, God's word is to be used to know the will of God and to follow it. If he really understood who this king was, he would have gladly said... I must become less and he must become greater like John the Baptist did. Not his intention. Because that's not the power behind him. We know that this is a spiritual warfare. We have all these characters that are involved in this spiritual warfare. Notice that he asked what time? He wanted to know from the wise men. What time did you guys see the star? When, would, when did it first appear to you? Like before you made this long journey across, across the world to get here, when did it first appear to you? I want to know. Because again, he was already plotting what he was going to do. Verse 9 and 10 after listening to the king, the Magi, they went on their way, and behold, the star, there it is again, the star. You guys have a picture of what that could have been? So it, it had disappeared, and now they're on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So again, the star led them. To, there was, there was, hey, this was the first GPS right here. <laughs> led them right to the place where it was supposed to be, where he was going to be, where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. You know, we should have the same response. You know, when we, when we see the manifest presence of God... We should have the same response. You know, we aim for that every Sunday, right? We aim for that. We pray for that. We, we seek it. We create an atmosphere for him to show himself to us each week. And I know that there are weeks where we miss the mark, but we're, but we're shooting for that every time. But when God does show up, we should rejoice like the Magi did exceedingly with great joy that we've been in the presence of God. In verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, when it says here, they fell down and worshiped him, the, the actual word there, which I want to bring up because we've, we've, uh, some of you guys, have, we have learned this word together in teaching about worship 
and things like that. But the, the word is proskuneo. Proskuneo is the word. And uh, proskuneo uh, literally means to kiss the hand in reverence, to express an attitude or gesture one's complete dependence on or submission to a high authority. And that's what it communicates. And in Hebrew, it, it means to get on your knees and put your face to the ground. I would like to tell you that this word for this word for worship here is reserved only for the worship of a deity. This would not be an action that they would do to any other person or any ordinary king. They didn't walk into the palace at Jerusalem and do this to Herod. Right? They didn't do that to him. This was reserved, this kind of worship, this kind of display was reserved for a deity only. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 11, it says, And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Proskuneo is the same word used there. They proskuneo God. Proskuneo is the way that we worship God in our heart and spirit. As well. Now we have all three of these gifts, and, and they are want you to know that all three of these gifts are ordinary gifts that are given to kings, not ordinary gifts that would be given to other people. But when it came to royalty, when it came to kings, these were normal gifts that were given to royalty. Uh, these three gifts were all gifts that also would have significant meaning. We have the gold was given as a gift of value and the symbol of his kingship on earth. That's what the gold was given for. The frankincense was used as a perfume. And also uh, frankincense was burned as incense and was given as a symbol of his deity. Um, so when incense was burning, that's what that represents. Uh, his deity. And then myrrh was commonly used as an anointing oil. Uh, it also an embalming oil. And, um, and was often burned as incense specifically at funerals. And these gifts given as a symbol, this gift was given as a symbol of his death. We read about that in John 1939 that when, when they were preparing Jesus's body that they used myrrh which brings us to verse 12 it says and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod they departed to their own country by another way So these were Gentiles, but after meeting and worshiping the king, they were obedient to God. Isn't, isn't that the way that it works for us? Like before we come to Christ, we are from a far off land, right? We're lost. We come and we meet the king. We meet him. And we accept him as king over our lives. And then we obey him. You know, the issue is, is when people try to get those things out of order. And um, I'm going to tell you, it's, you can't really obey him until you meet him. You can't obey him until you accept him as the king over your life, as your boss, as your ruler. Only then can you begin to truly obey Jesus the king. 
So in this story, and I know I took a lot of time describing these characters, but there's a reason, because you and I can identify with these characters. We were introduced to these different people, and we had Herod. There we go, it's the last time. Who saw Jesus as a threat and wanted no part of him and actually wanted just to get rid of him. We're going to find out next week. Obviously, he was carrying out the plans of Satan to murder him. You could really categorize him as hostile towards Jesus or even the idea of Jesus. Do you know anybody like that? And then you had all of the Jewish religious leaders who knew the facts about Jesus but didn't believe that this was the actual king of the Jews. They weren't going to worship this Jesus. They were so focused on their way of life and living and trying to gain status in a worldly system where they used religion to control politics and to control people. So focused on being wealthy and having a high place in society that it really didn't matter to them that he was born. Do you know anyone like that? Maybe that was one time your story. Maybe that story is creeping back into your life right now. Finally, we, we have the Magi. These Gentiles who were searching for the king, and when they found him, they worshiped him. Proskuneo. Is that you this morning? Have you searched and found the king? Have you worshipped him and made him king of your life? If you haven't done that, then today is the day. Today is the day. Christ has come. The king is here. The one who has come to save the world from their sins. God with us. Where we can exchange our sin for his righteousness. We have so many people in our society, in our world, that say, when it comes to Jesus, they'd be like, yeah, I know that guy. I don't, I don't, really, I don't really follow him. He's definitely not king over my life. You know, whether you make him that or not, he is. Will you just respond this morning to that, just to that, that Jesus is king over your life. And when you look at, when we examine ourselves, we, do, we can just see, okay, what areas, he is the king, but what areas have I not recognized that? And what areas of my life have I not proskuneoed in front of him to worship him, to allow him to take over that? And would you do that today? Today's the day. He's here. He's come. He wants to meet with you. So in this moment, will you just do that? Will you make him king over your life today?